Hey everyone, welcome to this exclusive master class, Mastering the Mental Game, thanks to Stake Me to Play. My name is Jared Tendler, mental game coach, been doing this for over six and a half years, coach over 300 players from around the world, uh, and I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about what I know about the mental game. You know, the mental game is one of those things where if you're not working on it, you risk falling behind. And you know, there's a lot of players who are making major advancements in their game, in part because they're working on their mental game. And today I'm going to show you exactly how to do that, and I'll go over the overview in a minute. Uh, but I do want to say also that there's a lot of information out there about the mental game, about poker. You know, and finding the right information is a necessity. So one of the major things I'm going to do for you today uh, is to give you an overview of the mental game, to give you an idea of the areas that you need to be focused on, because it does apply to everyone. I mean, if you think about it, right, the mind is your tool to access all of the tactical knowledge that you know. And if you're not accessing that, that knowledge, uh, you're unable to perform at the level that you want. So the mental game does apply to everyone, and there will be something for all of you in this seminar today. Uh, hopefully a lot, uh, but at a minimum, you will find something that will help you to improve pretty much immediately. I'm also going to show you how to learn more about your mental game. I mean, if you don't understand the details of your poker game, the specific mistakes that you make, the specific spots that you tend to have trouble with, if you don't know what those are, how can you plan to improve? Your improvement is going to be fairly random. You're going to be watching videos, uh, reading articles that are going to randomly help you. Apparently they might, but uh, they're not going to necessarily have the, the staying power that you need to really uh, improve your game. If you were to study your tactical game and really understand your mistakes, then you already, ha you already know what to be working on. The same is true in your mental game. So I'm going to help you today to identify both the areas of strength and the areas of weakness so you can begin focusing on the things that you need to most, which are making your strengths, making the good areas of your mental game happen more often, and making the weaknesses happen less often. Fairly simple math here. Okay, so there are two general kind of areas of poker. There's the tactics, right? Odds, strategy, hand analysis, table image, metagame, just to name a few. This is the stuff that generally poker players work on most where they tend to lack some work is in the mental game. And as it says here very clearly, the mental game is what allows tactics to be used. Your mind is the tool. If that tool is not sharp, that tool is tired, that tool is tilted, you're not going to be able to access the knowledge that you have worked so hard to acquire, whether it's through videos, working with coaches, studying with other players, or just playing the game. And so today I'm going to be helping you to really understand how to get that tool, your mental game, to work very well. So these are the general areas of the mental game. And those of you who are familiar with my books will know that these are the major chapters that I talk about. Uh, on the one side, you've got tilt, fear, motivation, and confidence. There are issues here. There are also opportunities for strength. On the other hand, we've got the zone, learning, decision-making, focus, goals, self-discipline, mental endurance. Now, these are not the only areas of the mental game. There are others, but these are the ones that I think are the most important. And I've spent a long time studying the game to narrow it down to just these. If you are only working on these areas, you are guaranteed to improve. If you're working on some of the other stuff, I think your improvement is going to be fairly random. So what you have, what you see here is a general structure for what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to go into detail about each, uh, each specific area uh, and then give you some opportunities to better understand each one for yourself and, and hopefully make some uh, improvements pretty immediately. So uh, before I get to that, though, let's talk about a few mental game myths. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of bad information out there, as I said. And I want to talk about uh, six different myths that, that exist here. Uh, Emotions happen for irrational reasons. Now, the reason that that is flawed or a myth is because you don't have the reason yet to understand why your emotions make sense. Let me say that again. Emotions make sense once you have enough information about why that's true. I think today you're going to have an opportunity to better understand why you tilt, why you are fearful or lose confidence. Uh, those are some examples. but. But if you have the idea that your emotions are happening for a reason, 
then you are at least invested in figuring out what that reason is. If you believe that your emotions are irrational, well then you're invested in keeping them that way. Or you're just going to kind of throw your hands up in the air and say, I don't know. It, it, I, it's, it's me. You know, I'm the reason. I'm, I'm somehow damaged goods or something. And I just don't believe that that's true. And I have a lot of proof uh, to show that that is. Okay. Next one. If you quit before you tilt, you don't have a tilt problem. Why is that a myth? Well, because you have a tilt problem that's just being masked. It's being hidden by quitting. Now, yes, you're not tilting at the table, but that tilt is definitely limiting the amount of volume you can get in. And you also kind of run the risk of getting into a position where you're just going to blow up one day because uh, you're actually not even addressing the tilt problem. So there's a couple things with this myth. Number one, um, when you're trying to assess your mental game, one way you can do that is to actually put yourself in a situation to have your weaknesses come out. Now, yes, in the short term, you risk losing money by doing that. But in the long term, you gain the information needed to un better understand your mental game so you can better understand what you have to fix. So quitting before you tilt doesn't mean that you don't have a tilt problem. It just means you need to do some more research to better understand your tilt problem. Okay, correcting a problem is as simple as saying don't do it. Well, the reason that this is a myth is because it's just not that simple. You know, the mental game is, is uh, a skill in a sense. You know, it, it, this, this myth would be as simple, uh, the, the comparison uh, with this myth would be like an, saying in poker, well, the key to winning in poker is to just win. I mean, it's too simple. There's not enough kind of detail to understand why the problem is actually happening. If you don't understand what's causing a tilt problem or a problem with your decision making under pressure, if you don't understand what's causing the problem, your attempts to fix it are going to be somewhat random. Uh, they may last for a short period of time, but they're not necessarily going to last for the long term. And that's really what, what I strive to, to, to encourage my, my clients to do uh, and certainly wrote about in my books, that you're looking for long-term solutions, not just short-term fixes. I mean, you do the same thing in your poker game. You're looking to develop a game that can last over the long term, uh, not just over uh, you know, a short sample. Okay, it's possible to always play your A game. I can't tell you the number of times a client will come to me saying that they want this. They want to be able to play their A game all the time. And it's impossible. And the reason it is impossible is because ideally your A game is constantly advancing. <laughs> it's possible to play your current A game forever. But <laughs> that means you're, you're eventually going to stop. It means you stop improving. It means your current best is the best that you could ever have. Well, you don't want that. You want to be continually advancing and improving. And in that process of improvement, where your, your A game is actually getting better, you're going to make some kind of B game mistakes and some C game mistakes. But the, the whole key is that your entire range, not just your A game, but your B game and your C game, or however you want to define your worst, continues to advance over time. So that you are playing better, or in essence, you suck less when you're playing at your worst. So if you're going through a major downswing today, in three months' time, if you work on your mental game and your tactical game, you'd want to be able to prove that your C game or your worst had actually gotten better uh, during your next downswing. And, and that's a real key, uh, both improving uh, tactically and mentally, is not just improving your A game, uh, but also improving your weaknesses. You can win just by thinking positively. I mean, <laughs> when somebody says one time, you know, they're basically seeking for some control over the cards, or they're wishing that they could have control over the cards. Or, you know, you might start a session just really kind of eager uh, to, to have today be the day you win because you've been on a, on a downstretch lately. But you don't really have any control of that. And if you think that just thinking positively uh, is going to impact the cards, well then basically poker has sort of changed from being a game that is strategic to a game being played on this like mental level where we're going to see who can be the one uh, to think the most positively because there has to be a winner. And I promise you that it's not the person who thinks the most positively. There's actually research to show that for some people, being pessimistic, being somewhat negative is actually better for them. Now it's not for everybody, but the point is that thinking positively does not make you a successful poker player. 
being a good, skilled poker player makes you a good poker player. Having a good, strong mental game is part of what makes you a good poker player. So those are the things you want to really be focused on. And yes, being positive can be helpful, but it also can make you delusional. I mean, if you're thinking too positively about your game, you might ignore weaknesses that are actually causing the downswing. Okay, confidence is necessary to play well. There's a lot of people that believe that confidence is essential to performance. And I'm not saying that confidence is not important. Believe me, having confidence is important. What I'm saying is that having skill is more important. And I'm going to show you more about why this is true later in the presentation. So I'm going to uh, forego explaining that a little bit more now. Okay, so in order to kind of really get you started in, in improving your mental game, better understanding your mental game, we've got to go through one specific rule here uh, that has to do with emotion. Because tilt, fear, confidence, motivation, uh, places kind of where the major issues are in, in players' mental games, they're all emotions. Confidence is, emo and, and confidence is an emotion. Motivation is an emotion. And basically, the deal with emotions is that uh, if your emotions rise too high, it actually has the power to shut down higher brain function, including thinking, decision-making, planning, organization. If your emotions are too high, you're going to play poorly, you're going to lose control of your emotions, because emotional control comes from your mind. That's where you're able to do it. If you lose that ability to think and, and sort of contain uh, your anger or contain your fear, then you're not going to be able to do it. <laughs> you're going to blow up. But there's so many people that expect to be able to control their emotions or to play well at all times, but that's not the case. So I'm going to show you a, a graphic here that's going to help to kind of put this into context. Okay, this is called the performance stress curve. And basically what you'll see over here is performance uh, on one axis, and on the other side is arousal or stress. Arousal just being a psychologist term for, for stress or emotion. Now, as you can see here, the ideal is right in the middle. This is the zone, really, being at the peak of your mental function. Now, people experience the zone differently, so your kind of level 50 might be different from, from somebody else, and I'll talk about this more later, but to the, to, to the point about emotion. If your emotions rise too high, let's say level 70, right, your performance is going to drop because you don't have enough energy, or you actually have too much energy, too much emotion, and that emotion is sucking away higher brain function. But on the flip side, if you have too little energy, let's say at level 30 here, you're tired, uh, you're a little bit bored, losing motivation uh, for whatever reason, uh, say your goals aren't are high enough, you're not gonna perform well either. So if you're tilted or you're bored, you're gonna basically suck equally because your emotions, uh, on the one hand, were too low to stimulate enough higher brain function, enough uh, for you to be thinking and, and making good decisions. And on the other hand, it's going to take away uh, enough higher brain function in order for you to be thinking and making those decisions. So, so you can see there's like, like there's a delicate balance here in understanding, uh, uh, a delicate balance in your peak performance. Uh, and being able to understand the factors that lead you to go this way and the factors that lead you to go this way are really critical. On the other hand, too, you want, you want to be able to figure out how to get yourself prepared enough at the beginning of your session uh, to get yourself all the way up to that peak because that's really where you want to be performing as consistently as possible. Okay, so let's get, get into uh, tilt, which is far and away uh, the biggest mental game issue in poker. Uh, the problem is that uh, there's a lot of kind of conflicting ideas about what tilt actually is in poker. And in my mind, having studied this for a long time, having listened to many conversations about poker players talking about tilt, by and large when they're talking about tilt, they're talking about anger. And specifically anger that leads to bad play. And obviously you can be angry, you can be a little bit pissed off and have it actually fuel you. You know, if you're a little bit bored, uh, sometimes players, you know, start out a session where they've, uh, they're just not really mentally sharp. They get down a couple buy-ins, they get a little pissed off at themselves, and then they play great the rest of the session. You know, that's an example, just to go back to it quickly, uh, where, let's see, uh, where you were here, you get some, you get pissed off, and that fuels you to get into the zone. 
That's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> we're talking about the flip side, which is the tilt. Uh, one sec. The tilt that leads you to go from here all the way down to here. That's the bad play that we're talking about. And generally, when poker players are talking about tilt, they're talking about anger. And in my research, in my work with my clients, I found that there are generally seven different sort of forms of anger that emerge. Uh, the, the first one um, is running bad tilt. Fairly obvious here. But what is not obvious is that running bad tilt is not necessarily a unique form of anger. What happens is that when you're running bad, one of these other forms of tilt happen so often in such a short space of time that your mind doesn't have enough a space to process it all. It doesn't have enough time to kind of cool down. And so what ends up happening is that you're, you're essentially accumulating all this anger or frustration and it just blows up. And then at the end of your day, you kind of still have this anger. It like affects the rest of your day. You're unable to sleep. You're unable to go out with your friends. You don't even want to go out. Uh, you don't even want to talk to other people because you're still so angry. And so then the next day you play, you might kind of come with a fresh attitude, but there's some frustration kind of still lingering. And then of course what happens, you lose again, more anger gets created, and then this whole cycle starts to repeat. And so that's really the damaging effects of running bad tilt. And so if you're gonna solve this type of tilt, it begins by really trying to minimize the accumulation of all of those sort of data points that occur during your play, and then being able to break it down at the end of your day and get yourself prepared at the beginning uh, to go back and do battle. Uh, now, the way to do that is to identify which form or forms uh, of tilt you're struggling with. So if we're going to talk about um, you know, being able to uh, better understand uh, each of your forms of tilt, uh, let me just describe a little bit about each one. Hate losing tilt, again, fairly obvious by the term, you generally hate losing. These are people who are very competitive and they just need to win. And they don't, even though they logically understand that poker is a game of variance, they still want to win and they're attempting to win uh, in nearly every session. And so uh, there's, there's anger that almost gets created from losing almost any single hand that they're, they're playing in. Folding, uh, not such a big deal. Injustice tilt. Injustice tilt is probably one of the largest uh, contributors to running bad tilt. Uh, and it comes in this sort of, like this feeling as if what's happening to you is unfair, it's unjust, you don't deserve it, you're a hard worker, you prepared yourself, uh, you should be getting what you deserve. Uh, and the thing about injustice tilt is that it does come down to that feeling of injustice. So you're kind of looking for thoughts uh, that are connected to that. Entitlement tilt uh, is actually very, very close to injustice tilt. Again, it, it comes down to a feeling of, of deserving, feeling like that you're better, that you're owed something. But what, what distinguishes entitlement tilt is more about a feeling um, that you're 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 getting taken uh, money's getting taken from you from someone else. Injustice tilt is more kind of about being pissed off at poker in general. You're not upset about any one particular player, but entitlement tilt is really where you feel like you're the better player and you deserve to win because you know of these idiots who are just playing bad and getting rewarded. You know it's more of this sort of superiority complex, uh, which many of you would relate to Phil uh, Phil Helmuth, who's. <laughs> been a classic entitlement tilter over the years, uh, although to Phil's credit, he's definitely gotten better. Mistake tilt, again, fairly obvious. Now, mistake tilt is generally going to happen to people who are perfectionistic, who have high expectations, or who have some kind of error in their understanding of the learning process, because mistakes have to be made. It's just, if you don't make mistakes, you're not learning, and if you're not learning, you're not getting better, and if you're not getting better, what the hell are you doing? So mistakes are going to be made, but how you interpret those mistakes uh, oftentimes can lead to anger. Now we're trying to understand what those flaws are, but again, mistake tilt uh, is a big problem for a lot of people. Revenge tilt, um, almost one of, one of my favorites because it generally comes out in ways that are pretty amusing. Uh, but revenge tilt happens because you know you've been slighted by somebody. It's a lack of uh, you, you feel like they're they're disrespecting you. Uh, you feel like the way that they're playing is disrespectful. Like they shouldn't be constantly re-raising you or being aggressive in the way that they are. Uh, or maybe they've uh, you know just gotten the better of you over the over the years, and you kind of have this like accumulated revenge towards them that they don't even they're, they're not even aware of. Um, so revenge tilt another another big one to uh, to be to be looking out for.
the last one, Desperation Tilt. Desperation Tilt is basically like the line between a real gambling problem and what I would call a more performance related problem. Now, I make that distinction because if you have a, a real gambling problem, you need help beyond what I can provide to you. I am a licensed therapist, but I'm not specialized in gambling or, or people with, with a gambling addiction. Desperation Tilt kind of gets close to that. And it, it, it basically kind of takes the form of the players who, you know, are they get stuck and they just feel like they need to win uh, in order for them to quit. And so they'll grind these major sessions where they're just trying to get unstuck. And of course, in doing so, they lose a lot more money. And there's just like this feeling of compulsion, like they can't leave the game down money. Uh, and especially if they've, you know, kind of regained a bunch and, and are about to quit and then lose a couple buy-ins. It almost makes them. Uh, it almost kind of fuels that that desire to uh, to win back money even quicker. Desperation tilt leads players to jump up in stakes and try to win back money playing in games they really shouldn't. It it leads them to go to into, into the pit or playing uh, casino games trying to make money back. But that's generally kind of the feeling. It, the desperation is wanting your money back and you want it back as fast as possible. And once you have it, the desperation seems to subside. But that doesn't mean that your problems are gone. So keep an eye out for each one of these forms of tilt because they can be uh, major, major problems. Um, now, let's talk about the ways in which tilt shows up. Because tilt doesn't always mean just blowing up. Your head does not have to explode. You don't have to be the guy who's you know, slamming the, uh, the table, uh, breaking monitors, uh, getting pissed off or berating your opponents, whether it's in chat or, or live in a tournament, or live at, uh, at the casino. You, know, you can have this kind of internal frustration where you're just steaming. You're literally just kind of simmering in your own anger. Or it's showing up in, more, in smaller ways where it's just kind of like this like minor frustration that's just kind of there sucking up your energy. And I say that specifically because we go back to the performance stress curve. And even if you're like at level 60, there's still room for you to be playing better. So I, I don't care how big your tilt is. If it's there, it's a problem. Now, whether or not it's a problem to be working on first, because you might have other areas of your mental game that might be uh, more of a priority, but the point is, if you have a small tilt problem, it is something of note, and at some point you're going to want to work on it. Okay. Quitting before you tilt, you still have a tilt problem. already mentioned that. Um, tilt can be a good thing. How the heck can tilt be a good thing? It costs you money, you end up feeling bad, sometimes even embarrassed by your actions. Why is it a good thing? It's a good thing because even though you're tilting, it can help to expose underlying weaknesses in your tactical game. So whatever mistakes you make when you're tilting, I don't care that they... Uh, whatever mistakes you're making when you're tilting, it doesn't matter what that, that, that tilt is making those mistakes show up. The fact remains that there are areas of your game that you're not doing. Let's say you know your pre-flop decisions are, are pretty much known very well. Like You don't make those kinds of mistakes even when you're tilting. There are always some parts of your game that still kind of hold up and are solid no matter how badly you're tilting. And I'm going to talk more about uh, what that is in, in a little bit when I get into learning. But the bottom line is that the tilt can kind of help to, to kind of peel back the layers of your skill set. So you can really see where there are tactical weaknesses. Because there are some tactics that don't get exposed by the pressure that tilt put, that the tilt uh, creates to your your tactical game, so being able to kind of assess your your performance after a tilt session is a really important thing. A lot of players get done uh, after a session like this, and the last thing they want to do is think about their game. But I'm telling you that it's one of the most important times for you to do research on your game because it can help to show areas of weakness. Now, in the future. It can also help to highlight where you've made some significant progress. You know, progress in the mental game is really kind of hard to measure. A lot of times we're relying on a feeling. And in three months time, you might have worked on your, on your tilt really hard, but when you tilt three months from now, it still feels the same. You still get pissed off. So we're looking for something more objective to prove that you've actually made progress. And improving your tactical game is one way to show that. So today, you know, or in, or in three months from now, you might uh, not make the same level of mistakes. You might be able to recover uh, from tilt faster, like it doesn't affect the whole rest of your day. 
or you know you're um, you're able to just kind of take a small break and come back. Uh, you you no longer go on desperation till you still get pissed off, but the level of severity in terms of your uh, emotional decision making is not quite as bad. So the point is that that tilt uh, can help to identify weaknesses, and then over time, you you know when you still tilt in the future, because it's very hard to get rid of entirely, uh, you can see some more objective ways to uh, to evaluate your game that can actually prove that you've made progress, even if your emotions are, have remained the same. Okay. Fear, another major area of the mental game that very few people are aware even exists. Right now, if, if tilt in the old world was just anything less than playing your best, you could be drunk, you could be tired, you could be uh, pissed off for one of the reasons I've mentioned. But if there's any reason, if, if, if tilt is anything less than playing your best, then fear doesn't exist, right? So fear for most poker players is is something that they're just not really tuned into. They're not really aware of a lot of the symptoms uh, of fear, and I'm going to show uh, more of them to you on the uh, the next page. Uh, but what you're looking for with fear is that uh, fear can exist in small ways. You know, worry, uh, doubt, like second-guessing decisions uh, can be forms of, of, of fear. Just smaller versions of it. Now, you know, it's not like a phobia. Uh, anxiety or nervousness. These are the kinds of things that you're looking for, situations that you're looking for. Now, what are the kind of, kind of common types of, of fear that exist in poker? Uh, failure is a big one. Fears of failure, or it could just be some doubts about your ability to, to, to about your ability to succeed, or, or uh, worry that you may fail. Not a huge fear. Fear of mistakes. Fear of a bad run. Losing. Looking stupid. These are a handful of the most common ones. Now, looking for fear. As I said, it can be hard to find. Uh, your mind goes blank. Uh, you, you know, you're in a big, you're in a big hand, and all of a sudden, it's just like you, you just mind shuts down, locks down. You can no longer think clearly anymore, and it's like blank. That is a major symptom of fear. If we go back to the the performance stress curve. You know, you're probably at like level 90 to 100 at that point. Uh, now, this may have happened to you in other areas uh, besides poker. Uh, it's just this, it's the same thing though. That is caused by fear, and it's a major cause. Of, it's a major symptom of it. Uh, feeling rushed to make a decision. Sometimes players feel this for no particular reason, or none that they can identify initially. They just feel this like urgency to be making decisions quickly, like they're trying to get it, get the hand over with rapidly, so they can find out what they, uh, what's going to happen. Now, even though logically they want, they want to be prudent and think through the hand very, very clearly, but they're just sort of rushing to get the hand over with. Why? They're trying to deal with the uncertainty. Well, the faster you know the what, what's going to happen in the hand, even if you lose it, you at least know. And sometimes knowing is better than being uncertain. Constantly replaying hands. Major, major uh, example of, uh, uh, of, of a fear of mistakes. Um, if you're unable to kind of let go of a mistake, sometimes it's related to tilt, but more often than not, it's going to be related to this fear that you kind of have to know uh, what what happened in that hand, and so you're unable to let go of it. Again, it kind of comes back down to that certainty, that that doubt that exists. Uh, and if you don't feel like you can keep playing well because you're uncertain about a, a hand that you lost, that you may not even made a mistake, you just don't know what happened. Um, that's another symptom of fear. Mind racing. Fear is a major driver of the mind, just unable to being settled. You know, this can happen to a lot of people um, when they're trying to go to sleep. Sometimes that's because they played very long sessions. Sometimes it's because uh, anxiety is driving that. Feeling overwhelmed. Feeling overwhelmed in a particular hand. Feeling overwhelmed by studying. So fear doesn't have to, have to necessarily happen just while you're playing. Uh, it can happen as a way of creating some avoidance to uh, doing work off the table. Uh, avoiding decisions that you know are correct. Kind of like some risk avoidance, uh, risk aversion here. Where you might kind of take some kind of less EV lines or even some uh, negative EV lines uh, because you don't you don't want to uh, deal with some higher variance situations that you know are right uh, and you certainly would kind of push those edges if you were playing well uh, but when some fear uh, has popped up uh, you tend to avoid those. Motivation. Motivation is a huge topic in poker not surprisingly. In fact uh, many of uh, my clients come to me because they're <laughs> many, many clients have come to me after months 
they were just they knew they had problems, uh, but they were just even too lazy to contact me for help. So motivation is a major issue, um, and it helps to understand motivation if we kind of know just a little bit about what the heck it is. And it can be simplified with just this, this statement. It, motivation is the energy behind your goals. It's the emotion that you are uh, that is connected to your goals and the emotion that is driving you towards them. So being able to have a, um, enough energy uh, to work towards your goals is key. And a lot of players uh, don't. Or uh, they have... Uh, actually, I'm going to get to this on the next slide. Um, okay. It's key to distinguish motivation from inspiration. Inspiration is kind of like a sprinter, whereas motivation is more like a marathon runner. For you, for you as a poker player, generally you're going to want to have more of a motivation, more of that long-lasting drive to keep working day after day after day, rather than that, that sprinter kind of uh, way of approaching it, because <clears throat> you're looking for a, long, a long-term career. Unless you plan on being successful in poker for like a month or three months, uh, you need more of that long-lasting energy. And the problem with inspiration is that it burns out very rapidly. You, you, energy is a finite resource, and, and your mind only has so much of it. And so what ends up happening is that players get really inspired. They work super hard on their game, and then they burn out and they crash. As I say down here, one of the common problems, burnout. Um, and, and burnout is a major problem for players who, who go through these cycles of, of being super inspired, burning out, resting, recovering, where they play kind of minimal amounts of uh, poker, and then uh, getting super inspired, partially because they've been so lazy, uh, and then kind of go through that cycle again and again. Breaking out of that is a challenge, uh, but again, at this point, we're just trying to get you really aware of, of your mental game, and if that's a cycle uh, that you struggle with, uh, write it down, describe it more, um, and, uh, and better understand it. Here are some uh, additional uh, problems. Procrastination. Procrastination basically just means constantly delaying things. I mean, the reality is that many of you are actually very, very good procrastinators. It's skill in a sense. You should be somewhat proud of it. I mean, <laughs> many of you are, are experts in grinding tons of TV and uh, doing anything to avoid studying. Uh, but uh, procrastination can be connected somewhat to that, that inspiration sort of way of looking at things. Like, you're, you're, you delay things so long that it creates enough energy for you just to kind of get it over with and get it and get it done with uh, very very rapidly. And actually, uh, sometimes procrastination can be related to to fears of failure because you'll kind of just you don't want to fail, but if you delay something so long, you're not really going to be able to to make it good, you know, or as good as you could have. And so you kind of have an out if you fail because it's like, well, you didn't really try that hard. You procrastinated all this time. So obviously, that's not what you want in the long term. Uh, but it is logical, and as I said at the outset, we're looking for the logical reasons uh, for why you have these mental game issues. Burnout I've mentioned, uh, but I will say one other thing about burnout, which is that it's one of these things that, that is hard for players to recognize. Uh, generally, poker players, or not generally, <laughs> some poker players are extremely motivated, they're very hard workers, um, and when they get lazy, uh, they tend to think of themselves as being lazy, when in actuality they're probably burned out. You know, burnout is is kind of like the phys is like the mental equivalent of an athlete who has just been, uh, you know, in the gym every day, running, uh, exercising a ton, uh, and their body just begins to break down. You know, every time you go to sleep, every time you're resting, your body is recovering from whatever it is that you were just doing. You know, in the gym, uh, you know, it's recovering from the gym. Uh, if you've been playing a lot of poker, you know, your mind is trying to recover from that intense activity. Poker is, a, is, an, is an intense thing to, to be doing. Uh, and so being able to allow your, your mind and your body to recover uh, properly uh, is a way to avoid burnout. When that doesn't happen, burnout is going to happen. High expectations is a big motivational problem. You know, when your expectations of yourself are sort of so high, sometimes it can create uh, a feeling like you just don't even want to try. Uh, that's not what you want to be doing. And it's, uh, it's hard to have good expectations of yourself. Uh, but if you feel like you're unable to kind of get yourself to play as much as you need to, uh, try to see if you have expectations of yourself. That's a, a, a key place to start. Dreaming. You wouldn't think of, of, dream, uh, of, of, of dreaming about what you want to accomplish as being a cause of motivational problems. I mean, a lot of people say that it's a good thing, and I am too. I'm just saying that you don't want to get stuck in it. You don't, want, you don't want your dreams to become so vivid and so real 
that you, or in your own mind that they actually feel real because they'll be, they'll be it'll be a little bit demotivating for you. You know, if you kind of have emotion when you're when you're dreaming of of moving up in stakes or playing high stakes or making a million dollars or uh, winning uh, World Series titles or EPT titles, if you if those dreams feel so vivid, you'll actually lose motivation to accomplish them in reality. It's almost a little like The Matrix if you've seen that movie. You know, you want your uh, your accomplishments to be played out in reality, not just in your mind. And so again, if you're struggling to find motivation, see if you're dreaming a little bit too much. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, I wanted to talk about one more thing about uh, motivation earlier, but um, yeah, I'm already we're getting a little bit long already, so I'm going to keep things moving. Uh, there's a lot I can talk about, I realize that, and uh, certainly in, in future seminars I'll be talking much more about each one in, in detail. Confidence. Okay. Confidence ideally should be a reflection of your actual poker skill. Now, that's a hard thing to do because knowing what your actual edge in the game is is very, very difficult to identify. But what ends up happening is for poker players, they, their confidence comes from how they feel about their game. And generally that feeling is, as I say at the bottom here, closely connected to results. So uh, if you're winning, you feel confident. If you're losing, you'll tend to lack confidence. But what's real? Again, if, if you want to be good, if you want to have stable confidence, if you want to be able to retain confidence during a downstretch, you need to be able to have your, uh, your, the feelings that you have about your game to have your confidence more closely align your actual poker skill. Now, the Dunning-Kruger uh, effect is uh, basically the reason why many of you are profitable. Okay? The Dunning-Kruger effect kind of has two sides to it. Uh, the first side is that players are so unskilled that they're actually overconfident. If you can imagine this, it's basically the, the reason why a lot of fish play poker because they don't realize that when they're winning because of variance that they're not winning uh, because they got they don't realize that, they, that they're just getting lucky they think that they're actually playing well and I promise you this that many of you are overconfident in how you think about your own mental game that you think that you are stronger than you actually are but you're so unskilled that you don't even realize some of the ways in which you lack uh, real skill in the mental game. I'm hoping today that some of you are actually going to be losing a little bit of confidence in how strong you thought your mental game is. And I'm not saying that you're going to permanently lose that confidence. I'm just saying the seminar is bringing you back down to some reality that says that your mental game has weaknesses as every poker player on the planet, uh, every poker player's mental game on the planet has. You have, it's just a, it's a, it's a factual reality. Even Phil Ivey has weaknesses in his mental game. <laughs> his weaknesses just happen to be, in some respects, uh, far stronger than many of your strengths. <laughs> but but that, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have relative weakness. So again, uh, the reason that, um, uh, as I said at the outset, um, confidence is not necessarily essential for uh, success in poker is because of the Dunning-Kruger effect. What would you rather have, skill or confidence? You'd rather have skill. So you don't want to just have confidence. You want to have confidence that emanates, that comes from real poker skill. You don't want to be done and Kruger here and have so little skill uh, that you're actually overconfident. Uh, and now, ironically, the players who, who really have a lot of skill, sometimes they're, they, they actually lose confidence. They're, they're underconfident. And the reason is because they're sort of assuming that everybody else knows what they know. And if they're not feeling really confident about their game, you know, they just don't really value what they've learned. They don't really know where their edge comes from, or they, they kind of lose sight of where their edge comes from. Um, but they're, they're, they're making assumptions about other players uh, that just aren't real. So being able to have really stable confidence comes from not only uh, understanding your edge in the game uh, and your skill in the game, it comes from understanding your opponent's skill, how you match up. Obviously, that's what defines your edge. Uh, and then being able to recognize variance. Uh, variance being the factor that you obviously can't control, but being able to be more skilled at spotting variance allows you to determine your edge just a little bit better. And I do realize that ultimately uh, it is somewhat impossible to define your edge perfectly in the short term. Uh, signs of overconfidence, because I think generally poker players are unaware of uh, overconfidence. Uh, you might feel like you can beat anyone. 
You might feel that way, but it's not true. <laughs> it's just a feeling. You happen to be running good, for example. Uh, poker feels easy. Poker feels easy, great. But that doesn't mean it's an excuse to stop working or an excuse for your mind to become too relaxed. Go back to that perf the performance stress curve. When poker feels easy, if your mind drops too low, like to level 30, then you're not going to be performing as well. And if you're not performing as well, you're actually losing edge. And even if you're winning, uh, you're, you know, you're just not playing up to, to, to the standards that you could be. Uh, don't focus as much. Again, if you think you don't need to focus because you're so good, uh, and that's basically being fueled by overconfidence. You know, you, you're, you always have to be focused. Now, you don't always have to be focused to win money, <laughs> but you always have to be focused uh, if you want to be playing your best. Uh, you'll start playing more hands, thinking that it doesn't matter what you do, uh, and you know, in general, the uh, players will stop working on their game because why? If you're overconfident, you don't know, you don't necessarily feel like you need to. Of course, that's never true. Uh, signs of lacking confidence. On the flip side, uh, you might lack some trust in your game, uh, doubt you can still win, doubt decisions you're making. Uh, previous success might mean nothing. You might think that you just got lucky all this time. Uh, pessimistic. Uh, about the future, again, pessimistic about uh, the past and thinking that you got lucky, uh, or you may even be embarrassed. So tilt, fear, confidence, uh, and motivation generally makes up kind of the, the problem areas of, your, of the game. Um, and now we're going to be talking about the flip side, which are kind of more of the skill areas. The zone is, is basically where we lead off. The zone is basically the peak of mental functioning. When you are performing at your absolute best, uh, sometimes you're going to reach this state where, where everything just sort of happens, happens easily. Uh, the signs of the zone, right? Game feels easy. Your instincts are spot on. Uh, you're totally focused. There's just no distractions around you. And there's no stress. Certainly no tilt. Certainly no loss of confidence or motivation. Uh, the zone is like, like your happy place, man. It's just, it's, it's awesome. Uh, the problem is it doesn't happen very frequently. And I think poker players generally don't even realize that it can be something that can be predictable. But the zone happens for predictable reasons, just as tilt does. Right? The key is being able to understand what those factors are. And it is complex, believe me. If it were simple, uh, people would be doing it already. But it's not. Um, in my second book, um, I, I kind of break this down a little bit more, and certainly in future seminars I'll be able to kind of help you with, the, with this as well. But, uh, but for starters, um, trying to understand the factors uh, that encourage uh, you to be per performing at your best or performing in the zone uh, is something that you can be studying. So after instances where you play in the zone, take some notes down about what the heck was going on. Now one thing you want to make sure of is that you're not just running well. And you want to make sure that you're not overconfident in your assessment that you're not running well. right? Uh, so <laughs> I guess it's just so easy. When you're, when you're running well, I mean, all of these things are true, right? If the game feels easy, your instincts are spot on. You, you of course, never make mistakes when you're, when you're running well, although obviously you do you, in your own mind. It can be easy for you to think that you're not. Um, and, of course, there's no stress because you're just you know, printing money at that point. So one of, the big, one of the big things that you're looking to assess is your energy level because that comes back to that performance stress curve. You're trying to figure out the factors that lead you to have that ideal level of energy. Now, I've already talked about how a lack of motivation or a presence of tilt can kind of take you down from that peak. But uh, besides those emotional factors, you also want to be looking at physical energy. Now, a lot of people ask, like, what's the value of working out or the value of exercise? Well, I think in general, it can be a little bit overblown. But there is no denying that if you are in good physical health, having good physical energy, that, that physical energy feeds mental energy. The, you know, when you're exhausted, I mean, literally, you know, you've been traveling, you've, you know, red eyes, playing, played, you know, uh, tons of sessions, maybe at, like at, at the end of uh, the World Series, you know, you're totally burned out and exhausted. You're lacking physical and mental energy. That energy fuels your ability to get up into the zone. If you're lacking that, you have no chance of getting there. So that physical energy is important, so getting proper sleep, uh, your diet can impact that, and certainly exercise as well. Goals, I've already talked about the connection between goals or motivation uh, to getting into the zone. Uh, but the degree of challenge is one that uh, players don't often think about either. When you're not challenged, it's hard to kind of muster up that extra energy uh, to get you up into the zone. 
And so there's sort of this like delicate balance where you don't want to have the challenge be too high because if the challenge is too high, you might actually lose motivation. You feel like you like what you know you got no chance and kind of give up. It's like hopeless. Uh, but you don't want it to be too low because then you'll be bored and disinterested. And many players who struggle with focus, uh, certainly online or even live, um, sometimes feel that way or struggle with their focus because they're not challenged. So you, you're kind of trying to create challenges in that scenario. Uh, but again, we're, at this point, we're trying to assess your zone. Uh, and if you feel like you're just not playing in uh, a lot of sessions or a lot of tournaments where you're, where you're that challenged, uh, that can be a major reason for why you're not in the zone. Learning. Major, major topic in the mental game. And it might be a little surprising uh, that that is true. What I found, and, and frankly it was actually even surprising to me when I found it, was that a lot of um, kind of more basic level mental game problems were sometimes caused by failures in a player's understanding of the learning process. You know, if you think about it, if you're expecting yourself to have learned something, uh, but then it doesn't show up, well, then you get pissed off. You tilt from it. You might lose confidence. You might get might get anxious about it. But w w what if it didn't show up because you just didn't understand how to actually make that transfer from learning something off the table or having watched it in a video to actually making it show up uh, at the table? If you have that kind of a problem, you're going to create mental game issues. So understand the, lear the learning process is a really important feature uh, of, of having a really sound mental game. Um, now, on the other hand, learning is also a, a really efficient way to create an edge. And of course, you know, because you're learning something that is mental, uh, being able to learn mental skills uh, is an important skill to have. It's like having the skill of learning how to learn. That's essentially what I'm saying here. Um, now, players often don't realize that correcting mental game problems happens through learning. This goes back to one of the myths that I said at the outset. That, that correcting a mental game problem just is, is as simple as just saying don't do it. But that defies the logic of learning. Learning happens in a much uh, more kind of long-lasting process. It's, it's not something that happens on a light switch. Now you might acquire something immediately, but in order to, to learn it well enough to apply it in all situations at the table uh, requires a lot more. And here's a one area of learning, uh, just to give you some advice here, because I want to give you things that you can use immediately. Um, this theory kind of helps to explain that learning process a little bit more and, and essentially can show why it's not as simple as just saying don't do it. It's not as simple as watching a video uh, and taking that tactic on you know better three betting uh, ranges from the button for example uh, and applying it immediately when you apply. Uh, it's because of these four stages. Now the, the first stage is called unconscious competence which basically means Oh shit! <laughs> I just realized there's an error here. Apparently, I was uh, unconscious when I was doing this uh, <laughs> this PowerPoint. This is supposed to say unconscious incompetence. <laughs> so in this case, uh, you are so un so unaware of the areas that you are are weak. That you don't know what you don't know. This goes back to Dunning Kruger, back to examples of why uh, weak players think that they're good. They're so unaware they don't know how bad they are. We all have this. We all have uh, blind spots like this. Now, eventually you become aware of it. You become conscious of your incompetence. Okay? And that allows you now to become more aware or, and more active in the learning process. But that awareness of your weakness does not make you good. So many players think that just because they've identified a weakness, that it automatically means uh, that they're going to be able to be good. It's not true at all. You have to become competent at it and you have to be aware of what you're doing in order to do it. You have to be thinking. Conscious competence means that you have to be thinking about what you're uh, trying to apply at the table. Let's say it's tilt control. If you're unaware uh, of uh, the fact that you're even tilting, you don't even have the opportunity to think about how to control your tilt at that time. But now you become more conscious of it. You see the tilt happening and now you're able to talk through it uh, and you're able to retain you know, a decent enough level of play, maybe not, not in the zone, but also you're not majorly tilting. That's because of conscious competence. But eventually you want to get to the point where you are unconsciously competent. You have so much knowledge, you do it automatically, intuitively, all the time, under all situations. doesn't matter how stressed out, doesn't mean it doesn't matter how tilted you are, 
you retain unconscious competence. So when I talked about earlier about how uh, tilt can be a good thing, it's because it helps to show all the areas of your game that have not been learned yet. All of the conscious incompetence, all of the conscious competence that goes away when you tilt, uh, you know, that, that helps to show you that you still have to work on it. But if you get to the point, as I said, like three months from now, and you can see that automatically when, you're, when you were tilted, that you were still retaining some of this knowledge, it means that you trained some of it to unconscious competence. So well done. Okay, moving on, because I know I'm getting along here already. <laughs> so, all right, decision making. Decision making is basically everything. I mean, everything that I'm talking about today uh, comes down to execution at the table, being able to make the right decision at the right time. And the process of making a decision is actually a skill. And that process of making a decision kind of elevates as you acquire more skill. But sometimes what happens is that there's like this tension between your decision making process advancing along with your tactical knowledge that advances and that that creates problems so so there's a difference between mistakes being made because of a lack of knowledge and a breakdown in your decision making right so so a lack of knowledge would mean you made a mistake because you just weren't thinking about watch well, <laughs> you made a mistake because you, you just generally didn't know or you didn't know something well enough. You were still in that conscious incompetence, conscious competence phase where you're going to make mistakes because you're not ma you haven't mastered it yet. So there's a lack of knowledge. On the other hand, a breakdown in, des in decision making means that you actually have the knowledge, but your decision making process didn't access it. Right? It's it's like if you had thought about oh if you if you had thought to put somebody on a range, then you would have made the right decision because you could have put them on a range and could have come to the right decision but you either made a decision too quickly, you were a little tilted and so you weren't thinking quite as well, uh, but there was some reason for a breakdown in decision making. And so my advice to you is to learn how you generally make decisions. Do you go for the more linear route, which means that you make them in a very sort of sequential order, thinking about the same factors every time in this same order? Or is it more tailored, where you have like a set of factors, let's say there are seven factors, uh, that you're going to consider every single time you make a decision. Some of these decisions obviously are made uh, automatically, um, but for the most part, uh, you're you're like wading through all of these factors in some order that is specific to that particular hand. Either one is fine, but you're in you're generally going to be in one category or the other, and it's important to know which one you are because that way you can figure out what breaks down and what gets lost when your decision making falls apart. So. When your decision making breaks down, do you tend to forget about putting people on ranges? If, if so, when you find out the situations where your decision making tends to break down, you have to force yourself to focus on putting people on a range. And that's going to immediately allow you to access the tactical knowledge that you have because you were thinking about it. So that's just an example of, uh, of how to get better at decision, decision making automatically, but it's going to take some study on your end uh, to figure out uh, how to do that. Focus. Focus is your tool to gather data. Now that may sound a little odd, so let's just go over it one more time. Focus is your tool to gather data. If you have been focused this entire time, you have had the opportunity to gather data about the mental game in a way that you may not have known before. If you were not focused, if you were screwing around with your phone, which I, my phone's not near me so I can't show a prop, but you obviously know. <laughs> if you're screwing around with your phone, you know, if you're talking to the people around you, if you're surfing the web, whatever, then you're losing access to that data, but you're gaining access to whatever it is that you were focused on. So you may not have thought of focus in that way, but you can see the consequences in poker for a lack of focus because you're simply not going to gather the data that you need to make a decision. So sometimes you might have a lack of knowledge because <laughs> you just haven't been paying close enough attention to the action that's been going on around you to make the best decision that you could possibly make. So you didn't really understand the image of the, your opponents uh, or the, the ways that they were making mistakes in certain spots. You couldn't exploit that because you didn't have the knowledge, because you didn't gather it by being focused on the action. Okay. Now, major issues to look out for with regard to focus, boredom being a big one, you know, and boredom is generally going to be related to a lack of challenge, a lack of learning, a lack of interest, or a lack of goals. 
Distractibility. I mean, in today's society, being distracted is almost the norm. You know, we've got so many things that we have the potential to focus on that distractibility is, is just, you know, kind of accepted. But there are big consequences for it in poker. Now, if you're playing one table online and you're used to playing ten, being a little distracted, not a big deal. If you're used to playing online and you're playing live, you know, being a little distracted, not a big deal. If you're used to playing live and you get distracted for a couple hands, generally not a big deal. But if this is a pervasive pattern and it's a problem that's reducing your edge by 5 to 10 percent, that is huge because the cumulative effect of that lost data that you didn't gather means that your ability to improve over time is also diminished. So you're not only losing information today, but you're losing the future potential of gathering more data in the future. And as I mentioned before, burnout is a major issue with focus. Goals. Now, goals are essentially like, like an, uh, uh, an explicitly stated intent. Like, what is it that you want in poker? You know, goals, um, it, as it relates to the mental game, are, are, are impossible not to have. We all have drives and interests and, and things that are, are motivating us. We all have things that we want. Now, whether or not you make them conscious, whether or not you write them down, doesn't change the fact that they exist. Okay? So the question becomes, uh, what drives you in poker? What, what are the things that you are driven to accomplish? And I think generally it is a good thing to write these things down because it helps you to stay motivated when problems occur. You know, when, when, when athletes like dig deep, they're, they're digging for the thing that's going to spark their motivation to keep their interest as high as possible in succeeding. Now, whether that's within a tournament or whether that's, um, you know, in, in their workouts or their exercise away from uh, competition. The same is true in poker. Having the stuff written down becomes a way that you can kind of force yourself or, 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 or create some inspiration temporarily, create some motivation uh, to keep you working through some difficult times. Uh, the benefit of setting results-oriented goals. A lot of poker players think that results-oriented goals are bad. They are not. Okay, results-oriented goals are important because they freaking matter. We're not taking results out of the equation in terms of goal setting. They are hugely important. Okay, but the reason that they are important is also is also because they kind of set uh, your intent. They set uh, uh, like a line in the sand that you now have to figure out how to get to. So what I suggest is that when you set results-oriented goals and you determine what what you're driven to accomplish, that you also set goals related to how you're actually going to get there. Because just because you set those goals doesn't mean you're going to get there. doesn't mean you have any, any understanding how to get there. So set goals related to the process of actually getting to that point, and that's where you can create some balance. So that in the short term, if you're not having results in terms of uh, money uh, or the, the number of hours that you're, uh, you're getting in uh, or the number of titles that you've won, um, but you're actually learning a lot and you're improving in your mental game, you know, all of the, the kind of how things, then you can maintain some confidence, you can maintain some motivation uh, during a time where results haven't been as good. Conflicting goals. Talked about procrastination earlier. Procrastination is a huge cause of conflicting goals. Oh, sorry about that. Um, is a huge part of, uh, of a conflicting goal. On the one hand, you are driven to have a ton of success in poker, but on the other hand, you're also interested in watching TV. So which is it? Poker? TV? I mean, that's an example of a conflicting goal. And you kind of have to reconcile that. You have to figure out in that moment what is more important to you. And, and that's a choice. Now, there are times where watching TV or doing things that typically would be procrastinating are fine. But they're generally going to be after you've gotten your work done. So, again, we're, we're at this point kind of assessing things. And I want you in your, in your setting of goals and determining what your goals are, to also be looking at kind of the motivations behind some of your bad habits like procrastination. Self-discipline. Now, generally poker players think that self-discipline is something that they could always have more of. And for many of you, for many of you that is true. But I want to make a very, very clear distinction. That self-discipline is a measurement up against your goals. Okay? The question is not whether or not you have self-discipline. All of you right now have a level of self-discipline. The question is whether that level of self-discipline is enough to reach your goals. If the answer is no, then you're lacking self-discipline. If the answer is yes, then and you're achieving your goals, 
then, then you have no problem with self-discipline. So, the, so the, the key here is that we, you don't want to have, you don't want to be more self-disciplined than you need to be. <laughs> you just want to have enough self-discipline uh, to, to reach your goals because if you're so uh, controlled at all times, if you're so disciplined in all areas of your life, um, sometimes that can actually lead to loss of motivation and a loss of enjoyment. You know, reaching your goals in poker should be enjoyable. You know, and if, if you're sort of too constricted by all these rules, uh, all this discipline that you're having to, uh, to give yourself, uh, you might suck the fun right out of it uh, and, your, and your career might be short-lived. Now, if you're trying to acquire more self-discipline, you need willpower. Willpower is essentially the energy source that allows you to be more self-disciplined. But it's finite. And there's a lot of research that shows this. Uh, examples of how uh, you know students in school during finals are more likely to smoke and, and overeat because at times where they've been like working super hard and they're they're drained of energy, they kind of revert back to bad habits in their in, in the rest of their life because they just don't have enough energy to control themselves with their uh, with their diet uh, or with smoking, for example. So when you're trying to acquire uh, you know, or when you're trying to, let's say, reduce procrastination, you're having to use willpower as the source to do that. But if you're tired, uh, then uh, it can be tough. If you're trying to um, uh, keep yourself more disciplined at, uh, in the casino, for example, after you've lost uh, and, you're, and you're tilted about it, you know, you might be lacking willpower because you just don't have as much energy because uh, your energy is has been sucked away by all that anger. So the reason that this is important to know is so that your expectations are in line with the reality and you're not in this like state where you feel like you can always have perfect levels of self-discipline because it's just not possible. You have to be looking to acquire more uh, self-discipline uh, in the way that the uh, adult learning model and that, um, that learning model showed where you're becoming more conscious and you're trying to sort of steadily make progress uh, and not have it happen all at once. Um, time management, work off the table, and following rules are just sort of areas of self-discipline. Uh, and, and when you're looking and trying to assess your self-discipline, look in those areas. Do you feel like you're making you know, a good schedule? Do you feel like you, you need a schedule? If you, have you tried to set a schedule and not have been able to have the willpower to follow it? Where does it break down? Things like that. Uh, do you lack the willpower or the self-discipline to do the studying off the table that you know you, that you need to do? Are you following rules that you self, set, set for yourself? For example, with bankroll management uh, or with stop losses or, or with playing certain stakes. You know, essentially, these, er these are just areas for you to be assessing with self-discipline. Uh, mental endurance, the last major area of the mental game to talk about. Uh, and I really only want to talk about it this in, in a sense that, that you just realize that uh, mental endurance uh, is trained in very similar ways to physical endurance. Again, poker players kind of have this this belief that they could just be playing, you know, for hours on end because of occasionally they're they've been able to play for ten hours, let's say, and so they think they should be able to do that all the time. Well, it's kind of like a marathon runner saying, "Well, I should be able to run marathons every day." Well, no, you're you're able to do it occasionally because of all of that training. Now. If you want to eventually be able to get up to the point where you can be playing eight to ten hours a day, for example, you have to start with what you where you what you can do now. So, how much poker can you play at a high level right now? It's not just about getting the hours in. You also want to get the hours in at a certain level of quality. That's different than just playing. Anybody can just sort of sit down and, and autopilot for you know an entire day of poker. But if that autopiloting is not profitable, uh, you're making some pretty poor poor decisions. And then over what time period? You know, let's say you you average like 50 hours in a month, but you know you're able to play 10 hour sessions. Now you might start setting goals that you should expect yourself to play 120 hours next month. Bullshit. Not possible. What? It's it's very very difficult to double your capacity. You're trying to increase it by 70 hours, from 50 to 70. What is that, like a 120% increase? That's a lot to do in one month. Okay, and so what you're trying to do with, with mental endurance is build it steadily over time, much like you would build physical endurance. And I, I make this last note here, um, that automation is not mindless. Okay, automation 
uh, is basically um, unconscious competence, freeing up your mind to think about new things. So if you have a large chunk of your skill set to the level of unconscious competence, it means that you have less things that you have to think about. But for, for players who play many tables online or grinding for many hours at a time, that means that you're kind of energy efficient. You know, thinking is hard. It requires a lot of mental energy to think. Automation, fast, man. Energy efficient is really easy. So if you're gonna try to grind long hours, you also want to be trying to train more of your skill set to the level where it's unconscious competence because then it's automatic. Okay, so those are all the major mental game areas. Now we want to talk about assessing your particular mental game. Okay, and I think it's, it's a very critical thing to do. If you have problems in your game, as I said, you really need to understand where, like, more details about those problems. You know, if you're tilting and you're not really sure why or you're not able to kind of recognize how it even happened, then you have a very kind of beginning level of awareness. What we want to do is dig deeper, have greater recognition for your mental game so that in real time you'll have the opportunity to control tilt. If you can't see it happening in real time, if you can't see the potential for your decision making to break down, if you can't see that you're distracted until you've made some big mistakes, then studying your mental game is going to provide a tremendous amount of value because it gives you the opportunity to make corrections. Okay, now. That recognition, again, is one of those things that some people just think should be there, and it's not. It's a skill in itself. Understanding your mental game is a skill. Hopefully today you understand more about your mental game, right? But you're still kind of in that conscious incompetence stage. Now is the time to become more competent about your mental game, uh, and now is the time to start studying it. So here's what I suggest. Take notes regularly after every time you play for the next two weeks. Now, if you, if you play infrequently, do it for longer. But like two weeks of kind of full-time play, take notes at the end of every session. Now, in that process, or in that time period, I should say, also think back to the past six months about your mental game. Go back through all the areas I talked about and be looking for instances of problems with tilt, be trying to understand what created the zone. Where did your decision-making break down? What are your goals? What's motivating you? understand all of these different areas of your mental game and study them both in present terms uh, and then also over the last six months. And you can also think about how mental game issues or uh, you know focus or, or the zone shows up in your personal life. Because ultimately you're looking to create greater awareness and if you have awareness in areas that are, non, not, uh, that are not poker related that might help you to build awareness within poker. So basically what you're looking to determine at the end of these two weeks are what are the areas of your mental game that are strong and what are the areas that are weak. Now with the strength you're going to be trying to encourage that to happen more often and you're going to be trying to diminish the severity of your weaknesses. And that's something that I'll be helping you much more about in the future but again just having greater knowledge is essential because you and I can't work together in the future if you don't have greater knowledge. I can't help somebody who doesn't understand any aspect of their mental game. That's an extreme example. Obviously, I could have a conversation with you uh, and help to break it down even more, but the point is that, that right now your job is to better understand the specific details of your, uh, of your mental game. One more little tip uh, to help you do that. Um, if you notice that you have tilt, for example, or some fear, try to describe in as much detail as you can all of the thoughts that occur at that time, uh, the feelings that you may have, uh, those feelings might show up in certain parts of your body, like you might uh, have your fist get clenched, your, your face might feel tighter, uh, your breath might get shorter. Again, we're trying to create awareness, so anything is helpful, because sometimes players will realize that they're tilted because they start swearing, and that's like the first indication that they're on tilt. They didn't realize <laughs> that they had been making a bunch of mistakes, uh, or that they had been, uh, been pissed off for a while until they actually started swearing. So again, uh, thoughts things that you're thinking in your head or that you say out loud, uh, your actions and your tactical decisions. If you understand the mistakes that you make only when you're on tilt or only when you're when when you're feeling fear, then you'll know that you're feeling fear that you are feeling fear because you have made those mistakes. So again, we're looking for ways to become aware so that you can begin taking control.
begin taking action to correct your mental game. So that is it for now. Uh, I hope that this was very helpful in taking this first step to becoming a master of your own mental game. Uh, I wish you all very well, and I'll be sure to see you again.